Anybody else? Any work or? I'm surprised that the, the, the direct doesn't look like direct anymore. Like, as we know, like, I think three years ago it was literally like direct mail. Yeah, yeah. And now it's like the Grand Prix is yeah. uh, like something that, you know, it, it bears a little resemblance to any of that. Yeah, it's it's like all those categories sort of broaden out. You know, it's 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 the world is no longer simple, isn't it? We we used to kind of understand if you set a poster or a billboard, you know, we all understand what you mean. Well, now they can be moving, and they, you know, so what is it? Is it a is it film or is it a billboard? And everything's a bit like that. You kind of have to decide yourself, really, don't you? Uh, what it is that you, know, you think is direct. I always kind of cynically kind of say I always think. You know, there, there used to be an advertising a, 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 a kind of above the line and below the line. And it's a phrase you don't, really don't hear anymore, do you? I don't know. Yeah, on don't the line. That line. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, always, I always think, actually, what happened is digital made below the line sort of, you know, cool. <laughs> because nobody wanted to do below the line stuff. But uh, uh, some, somehow digital came along. And, and actually, really, what it was, it was direct, you know. It was kind of communicating directly with people, which is what a lot of below the line was, and uh, digital somehow made it sexy, uh, which, is, which is good. But I think one of the, sorry, I'll come back, one of the things I think that we, we got, we, we misunderstood over the last 10 years, because it's been a phenomenal 10 years, isn't it, you think about it, I mean that sort of tsunami of technology that's not, not only in our industry, but you know, revolutionising uh, music, it's changing the media industry, newspapers, stuff like that, you know. Um, I think we sort of confuse persuasion with promotion, um, you know, and I look at a lot of uh, uh, digital work, which I think is fantastic, but I look at it and it's promotion rather than persuasion, and there is a big difference between those two things. I mean, both are fundamentally important, but without persuasion there's no point in having promotion. You know, you've got to persuade somebody that you're worth having a conversation with. Now I'm going to have a conversation with you. Promotion is keeping that conversation going. So, uh, and I think, uh, you know, in the debate about the future of communication, that was sort of misunderstood by a lot of people. Uh, so, uh, but again, I think we're sort of kind of coming out of that. There's always inter it's an interesting point, I think, and I, I was uh, asked to give a talk recently uh, on the kind of the changes that we've seen, and I, I thought about it, and I thought I'd done. Um, I titled the talk, um, "Can you name Gutenberg's second book?" Uh, and you know, if you think about it, Johannes Gutenberg, 1440, was the Steve Jobs, Sergey Brin, Larry Page of his day. I mean, he invented the printing press and movable type, and revolutionised um, information. But you know, what was the book he produced? It was the Bible. You know, and you kind of go, "What?" Well, Interesting idea, Goody. You know, the Bible's been around for about you know a thousand years. Any other ideas? And of course, he didn't have any. Uh, oh, oh, what do I do now? Uh, and then suddenly we realised we maybe we needed writers. We could write books, write stories. You know, get people interested in reading these things. And I think what happens is whenever there's and, and you can look at any development of any bit of technology there is kind of a creative deficit that follows it because people become obsessed with the technology. So if you look at you know, the introduction of film, you know, the Lumiere brothers invented the cinema, really, uh, and what they did is they went out and filmed people walking up and down. I mean, again, they were technologists. They didn't understand that this was going to be one of the greatest forces for storytelling. They just thought it was a technical wonder that, oh, look at that, you know, I can show people. And of course, uh, uh, eventually people got rather bored with that and said, you better do something else. And interestingly, they gave up on the cinema. They, they thought it had no future. <laughs> and they went back to photography. <laughs> Just goes to show they didn't understand. Did they? But I think you get that, um, you get this sort of deficit, as I call it. And, and you're the same with kind of, you know, um, you know I think it was uh, Les Paul who invented or was supposedly developed the electric guitar. But, yeah, and that was about 1940, 41. But it wasn't until 1954 that somebody wrote Blue Suede Shoes and Rock and Roll was invented. It took you know, a period of time before somebody, this is amazing, look, you can do all that stuff. And then somebody goes, wait a minute, if you 
did it like this. You know, you'd, you'd have a, a whole new kind of genre uh, of music. And I think that's what's happened over the last 10, 12 years. We've been so kind of in awe of this thing called digital that we've kind of gone, oh my God, you know, this is absolutely amazing. I can talk to people one to one. I can have a fantastic conversation. Isn't it absolutely brilliant that you can do this? And, and I remember actually it, very early on and uh, when we were still with Levi's and they, they were getting hugely excited about it. Um, as, as, you know, you always get that feeling with brands that are supposed to be talking to young people, but they're not young. That they, they're, they're like your sort of <coughs> dad who's trying to be cool. They latch onto the cool bits without really realizing what it's about, you know. And they took me to see, you've got to see this fantastic new digital guy doing amazing things. It's absolutely incredible. Uh, uh, and I went along to see this, and, and you know, I'm full of, I was, you know, because I, I think technology is fantastic. Without technology, there's no creativity in a sense. All we could do is tell a story and sing a song to each other, and that would be it. Bars. You know, and that, that, you know, so technology is fundamentally important to creativity. Uh, you know, paintbrush was a phenomenal technological development, so painters could actually, instead of using a bit of stick and doing it on a, on a cave wall, they could move to a canvas. But anyway, so I went to uh, see, <laughs> and, and the guy had this little character, he showed me, this is absolutely amazing, and he had this little character that ran across the screen, turned around, stuck his tongue out, and ran off again. I said, oh. He said, oh, I'll show you again. I said, yeah, yeah, dude, maybe I'm missing something. <laughs> and I showed him, yeah, and, and it went across me into the same thing. But he said, that's incredible, absolutely. And I was going, have you seen Walt Disney's films? <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, and it was this kind of like, but he was so, um, uh, and the company was called Obsolete, actually. It's it it absolutely, they were called Obsolete, thinking they were talking about everything else was Obsolete, but actually their ideas were the ones that were Obsolete, and of course they no longer exist. Google them, they're, not, they're no longer there. Uh, but I just thought it was typical of that sort of thing, of, you know. They were like the Lumiere brothers, filming people walking up and down the street, going, you know. Uh, so I think we always have to be aware of, I mean, the opportunities technology gives us, but in the end, you know, people can, people connect with ideas and thoughts, and those are the things that change the world. Technology just gets them to more people. It gets them to people faster. It, you know, it gets you a bigger audience, which makes it a hugely exciting time now to be in this industry. I mean, fantastic time to be in the communications industry. You know, people talk about this being a kind of the golden age was, you know, in the 80s or the 70s. It depends how old you are when people talk about the golden age. Obviously. But I think this is a golden age. I think there are many golden. I think this is a golden age. So, you know, you, you've got to sort of understand the technology, but understand that actually it's it just makes your ideas more profound or bigger or better or wider. I mean, you can look at it and say, you know, since the beginning of time, we've, we've been obsessed with uh, with, with, with speed. Uh, and access. You can look at those two things, speed and access. That's it, really. I just, I just want things faster, and I want to get to more people. You know, the bow and arrow was better than the spear. It went further, it went faster. But anyway, sorry, that was just sort of an introductory ramble, really. You keep telling us like uh, about how this is a golden age, and we're there, and, but. For you, when is this key moment when you actually realized that this was going to be that important and that you were not only going to be like the Lumiere brothers and say, uh, you know. Well, you mean me personally, when yes. I was working, when I was... Um, well, I was very lucky. I mean, I was sort of a similar generation to Bob and we came into advertising. It's embarrassing to say when I came into advertising, so I won't, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of gloss over that, really. It's so long ago, you know. People look at you in amazement. They go, what? <coughs> when? Um, Commercial artists. <laughs> but I think we were part of a... In, in a way, we were, we were a generation that, that wanted to be in advertising. And we were a generation that was... You know, we were very lucky. It was, it was all about the 60s. It was about changing the world. The, the, the centre of focus had moved... Uh, towards a, a more youthful point of view and 
we understood that, that advertising could be interesting, witty, funny, smart. Um, it didn't have to be stupid and banal and all of those things. And we, we felt that we were part of a, a, a whole kind of new wave of thinkers who actually wanted to be in this industry as opposed to people who were sort of drifting through and really I'm a writer and I'll make some money by writing a few ads because that's quite easy, isn't it? Or people who wanted to be painters so they sort of thought well I can do a bit of design and art direction so I'll do that. We actually wanted to be in it and we wanted to kind of use advertising to change points of view and that was quite phenomenal I mean in a way that, at that time it was phenomenal and in a sense it, 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 the sort of the 60s didn't have, happen in advertising until really the 70s because although you had all this fantastic music that was changing you had painting you had fashion you had all those things that were changing in the 60s. But that was, those, those things that were changing weren't controlled by corporations. We were working for large corporations and they were still in the 40s, you know, and we had to kind of, so they still had the power. And it took a long time. And it was in the 70s really that it changed. And I, and I always say that, you know, um, there have really, really only been two great advertising agencies in my view. Um, and that's Golden Burnback, because they invented modern advertising. Uh, you look at uh, Volkswagen as a kind of, I mean, you know, you could run that today and it would be fantastic. Um, and Colin Dickinson Pierce, who Bob worked for and did some wonderful work for. And the reason I think those two were great is that CDP took creativity to the masses. They didn't, they didn't sort of do little funny things over here and will find some silly little account and pretend that, you know, it, it's going to be talking. They did it for Heineken and Fiat and brands in the UK like Hovis, which is a huge bread bag, which were national brands. You know, so all of a sudden, you know, we, you know the, the, the general public were looking at this work and going, oh, I like that. That's good. You know, I always used to quote, I don't, I don't, I don't mean anything to any of you, there's a little town north of England called Harpenden, and it's very middle England, you know. And I had an auntie who lived there, and I used to get, see her, and my auntie in Harpenden liked it, I knew it was good. And I remember her saying to me, John, did you do that Hovis ad? Because that's really good. And I, no, I didn't actually. <laughs> but it was, you know, it was winning a Grand Prix here. You know, their work, College of and Pierce, I think won more Grand Prix at Cannes than any other agency. And, and it was for huge, huge brands. So they changed people's points of view. They changed the way the world, the way that, that the UK public were looking at advertising and creativity. John, it's just, a, it's just a little aside on the Heineken campaign. When the Heineken campaign was first done, it won a bronze yeah. at uh, DNAD. And the agent, Frank Lowe, who I told you about yesterday, was so pissed off with that. He, because he, he was, thought it should have a goal, we sent the bronze back. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, no. but that's that's another example of you know juries rarely recognise truly groundbreaking work. They, they they recognise it far too late. They don't know if that's not so we were and unlike you, and this is why I think it's an interesting point. I think you're in a fantastic place because you're at the vanguard of all this technological. You know, there's this revolution that's gone on with technology. I mean, clients are going to believe you more than me about the future. Because they're going to look at you and go, well, you know, you're a digital native and, and I'm a digi digital immigrant. Uh, so they're going to look at you and say, you know, you're the one that knows about it. So they're going to listen to you rather than me. So it's a fantastic time for you. So in a way, you're in a with slightly, obviously, different circumstances, you're in an interest. You're in a very, very interesting place. So it's what you do with it now. Uh, but ultimately, I think you have to understand that whatever you do with it, it's it's about the quality of your ideas. You know, great line of John Cleese, who's a funny British Monty Python. He said, "Nobody ever laughed at lighting." <coughs> it's always a good line now. Anyway, yes, there was a, yes, sir. Um, could you share? Um something on your uh, fantastic uh, mathematical sort of formula, the 80% idea, 80% execution, if I got it right. Yeah. Well, it's... It, uh, I, <laughs> I just pull figures out of the air. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it could be 75%. I'm not quite sure I didn't add them up, really. Uh -huh. I mean, I, I was just trying to kind of uh, confront people with the conundrum of what it is that we do. 
and uh, I was talking yesterday with, with Dan Wyden and, and we, we showed, uh, he, he, I wanted to show and he wanted to show the P&G piece that they'd done for uh, the Olympics about celebrating mothers. And the point about that script, as I said in, in, in the meeting, you know, I, if I'd read that script, I, I really would have vomited. <laughs> oh, Jesus, give me a bucket, you know. Oh, God. But actually, its execution really makes it. And I think that's the thing that, you know, we all have to understand. You have to, and that's where craft comes back to craft again, you know. How are we going to make this? It's not just the idea. It's how does it communicate? Because you can argue an idea isn't, isn't an idea until it's made. It's still in your head. You know, I can say, you know, I've got this great idea, blah, blah, blah. And you go, yeah, yeah, that sounds fantastic, John. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you've got to make it. And it's in the making that the idea comes alive. You know, it's like, you know, you get all the ingredients for a cake and you mix it up and, and then you have to bake it. You know, and then it comes out and you go, ooh, look at that. Isn't that fantastic? So it's, it's, it's in that sort of place that sort of 80%, 80% that you have to kind of work out. The idea is, in a, in, you can argue the most important part of it, which is why I, I, you know, advertising is 80% idea. And then you add in the 80% execution, because you can change somebody's point of view about the way, you, <clears throat> the way you tell the story. I mean, I thought the artist, you know, which got the Oscar uh, uh, last year, was, was just stunning. And it was stunning in the way it was made. I just thought it was absolutely it was it was you know they, they didn't put a foot wrong and transported me into a kind of world and uh, uh, about you know success and failure and love and hope but they told it through this medium of a black and white movie star and that was a wonderful idea so I could have walked in and said here's the idea you know it's about <coughs> success and failure and, and it's about love and how love endures and, da, 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 and all of that. And then you go, yeah, yeah, yeah. We've well, been a few movies about that. Ah, but I'm going to make it about a black and white uh, silent movie star. And you go, oh, that could be interesting. So that's where the kind of uh, execution comes into play. I mean, we were uh, uh, very fortunate when we worked on uh, the Levi's campaign and we, we did something like, you know, 25 or so 501 commercials in the end, something like that. And what we did, we'd always kind of, we'd write something about, something like 50 or 60 scripts to get down to about three that we liked. And then we'd look at them and go, right, now we've got these three, that could be the good. Now, let's talk about how could they be made? What, you know, could we make this like that, or we could make this one that way, or we could make that one, that could be quite good. That could, and, they, and that, and the way you made them helped their freshness. And, and that was, you know, so we used to look for that. So that was an important part of the process. And I've always said, you know, I, I, I loathe it when people use the word original. You know, you, you know, especially when you're on juries, people say, no, it's not a very original idea. And you feel like saying, well, you, I, can, I can assure you of one thing, mate, you've never had a fucking original idea in your life because none of us have. Everything we do is a follow-on from something else. Everything we do, by definition, it's the most stu you know, the old line about God was the last originator, the rest of us are just copyists. Um, you know, it's looking at a fresh way of doing it. How could I do that in a way which really adds to the genre? And that's where execution comes in. So it's, it is fundamentally important. So, gentlemen behind you, yeah. So what I always uh, like scratch my head about is there's a whole academia world of like psychology, which is about persuasion, motivation, so much literature, at least like in North America, in our agencies, or at least the ones I've been at, there's, there's no conversation with psychologists and, and like, and I always wonder why, like if we're in the business of motivating and persuading, why is there sort of this gap? And maybe there isn't in the UK, and I'm always, this is something I'm always curious about, why my strategic planner doesn't have a psychology degree? There's no anything about like cognitive dissonance or any of those things. <laughs> Probably because most of it's bullshit. <laughs> well, I, I, although I said you know it's about persuasion and promotion, I use those words, but I always think we're in the inspiring business, uh, and I think <clears throat> that you know I'm I'm hopefully there to inspire. Uh, 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 and that's what I try and do with the work I'm trying to do. I'm, I'm this, 
this sense of, you know, I, I, I'll say, and I'm going to say things today that you can disagree with, you know, that's fine. I mean, don't, you know, you don't have to accept everything I say. You know, this is my opinion. And as we know, opinion can't be wrong because it's an opinion. But I think there's a, a lot of bullshit taught uh, all the time in our industry about how we connect with the consumer, you know. Uh, and if you walked into an advertising agency and, and you said, so do you think you have consumer understanding? I bet the agency would say, oh, yes, definitely we, have, definitely we have consumer understanding, you know. So I think it's absolute crap. I mean, absolute bollocks. I mean, the idea that, you know, it's, yeah, so it's you and God have this thing called consumer understanding. How a genius you must be. Now, we have consumer knowledge, which is a slightly different thing. I think words are very important. We must always remember. And that's about we have this knowledge of what's going on out there. We have this knowledge of what people are doing, what they're doing. And then we take that knowledge and we go, do you know, I think out of that comes this. But it is our opinion. Uh, and then I think what we try and do is we try and create work that inspires people to come to us. And I think that's, that's what great work does. It inspires people to come to you. And in that way, then, all the kind of psychology is like, well, yeah, you can, you can say that, you know, but you know, if you ask people what they want, you know, I, they, will, they don't know what they want until they've seen it. Show it to me. I mean, that, you know, without me going on about Mr. Steve Jobs, that's what he believed, you know. They don't know. They don't know what I, we can do. So let's show them and, and inspire them to come to it. But I think there's a huge lot of nonsense spoken in, in our industry. And, and of course, you know, complete charlatans who are making a fortune out of it by saying, you know, I have a way of understanding the consumer. Yeah. Ooh, yeah, genius. I always tell this joke, and it always makes me laugh. Because I, that's why it makes me laugh anyway. That's why I tell it. But, you know, you that thing that when you... You, you, you see the news and they've just arrested some bloke who's been chopping people up and eating them and, and stuff like that and they take them away. They always, and I've seen this around, not like go around watching, finding out <laughs> about people who've been chopping people up. But you know when you, and they always on news programmes then go and interview the neighbours, don't they? They always go, oh, now what was it like living next door to her, you know? And all the neighbours always say, always, without question, <laughs> Well, he was very quiet, he kept himself to himself. He didn't fucking understand they were living next door to a mad fucking axeman <laughs> chopping people up and eating them. So how am I supposed to understand what they want for breakfast, you know? I mean, <laughs> it's just, you know, fuck off, I don't. Um, so you, you know, your job is to inspire people. And I, I think, you know, I, I sort of think, you know, a, a novelist doesn't sit down and, and write a book saying, oh, you know, uh, I, I, I've done this consumer testing and I found out that people like sort of relatively long books but not too many words and they don't want the pages to be too... Di they write a story that they think is powerful that people will want to read. A painter it paints a picture and goes, you know, I think that this could make... Uh, or a filmmaker makes a movie that goes, I think this could be fantastic. And we're, in a way, we're in the same business. Uh, but we've somehow... You know, our industry has been sort of uh, infected with all these people with quasi-scientific theories about how you do it. And they're all charlatans. They're the snake oil salesmen of, you know, 150 years ago. And, and clients, of course, want to believe it because they, they want it to be certain. They're desperate for it to be certain. They're desperate for what you do to be a science. You know, do that equals that, da 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 that's a formula, I've got that right, that done, da 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 go home and play a game of golf. Life's easy, you know, but it's not. And it's constantly throwing up quirky things and people change because they see something over there and then, you know, somebody does something over there and they go, oh, that's interesting, I like that. You know, serendipity, that's what makes us interesting as human beings. If you don't understand that, then you'll never be a great communicator. But inspiration is what you're trying to, to do. You're trying to inspire people to come to you. And I, and I think the other thing, too, on that is, you know, and some clients sometimes get quite shocked when I say uh, when I say all this, and, and I go, in the end, you know, because you know, truth is the best, always the best advertising strategy, uh, and it's always the best way of conducting your <coughs> career. Is I do work that I like, right? stuff that I like. Do I like it? Because in the end, you're the only person you can trust. When you've written something, you know, you say to, what do you think of that? Yeah, it's all right. You think, mm, I wonder why they're saying that. Are they saying that because they like it, dislike it? 
It might be, it might be a valid piece of criticism, but actually, you are the only one that knows. And so you've got to do something that you think is great. And then you back it, go, and then you fight for it. And how do you know that you have found this great thing? Ah, sometimes you're so into well, it. there you go. <laughs> you never know, really. And that's why it's a mystery. You know, I mean, you don't really know. You're either good at it or you're not. And if you're not good at it, go and do something else. It's all right. Change your career. You know, that's, that, but that's the truth. Like, you know, you're, you're obviously all very talented people. All right? How talented, I don't know. But if you're not going to be great at it, go and do something else. And don't worry. You know, that, that what you'll have learned through this period of your life will hold you in great stead for almost anything else you want to do. But you don't know. You know. I don't think Picasso knew when he was painting, you know, Dora Mar that this was going to be viewed as, you know. But he thought, I'm going to do this. I think being daring, being different, frighten yourself, you know, try and try and make it as fresh as you can, you know, make it about a personal thing. Think about, you know, the truth. Is it the truth? Is there a truth in this? And I think you stand a good chance. But then it's down to a myriad number uh, of other things like skill. And can you write? Can you art direct? Do you have that sense? What makes a great writer? What makes an average writer? You know? I think that one thing I would say is only surround yourself with great things. You know, and it will rub off. If you surround yourself with shit, you'll start thinking shit. And, and again, people say, oh, isn't that a bit elitist, John? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely elitist. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But I don't want to, there's a, you know, place is full of shit. Just walking up and down that croisette, you'll see shit all over the place. You know? Why do I want to surround myself with it? So only, only engage with great stuff. Read great things, see great things, watch great things, observe great things. It will rub off. You don't get better by looking at rubbish. You will get worse. So, you know, that's one way of enhancing. That's why, through, you, know, you know, people of any industry congregate because they, they sort of, it's a natural thing that we do. You know, scientists want to be around other scientists because they might learn off them. You know, um, ar architects want to be around other good architects. Uh, and it's the same the world over. Artists want to congregate because I like what they're doing, you know. That's why, you know, when the Bauhaus was going, they all wanted to go to the Bauhaus because there were all these fantastic people there. They didn't say, well, I don't want to go there, lots of good people. You know, oh, I'll go somewhere that's rubbish. But, you know, surround yourself with great things and it, and it will rub off. It'll make you better. Whether you'll be fantastic is, you know, it's like playing tennis. You want to get better at tennis, play with somebody really good, you'll get better. If you play somebody worse, you'll get worse. <laughs> Um, I was going to ask, going back to what you're saying about inspiring and, and believing in your work, when you're in the pitch process, how much do you sell an idea and how much do you sell yourself, or you the three of you? Well, you're always selling yourself, because actually, in the end, somebody's going to buy you. Um, so your passion, your belief, your commitment to it, how you got to it, why you have got to it, are all fundamentally important. Uh, I mean, when we started BBH, we, we refused to do speculative creative work because we felt we wanted clients, one, to respect the creative product because that was the most important thing that we did. Uh, and by and large, at that time, back in 1982, we felt it was mostly strategy that was probably wrong and that, you know, get the strategic direction right and then build on that. So we'd spend whatever it was, the four weeks or so, you know, that we were given to do this pitch, evolving and developing a, a strategic presentation. And through that, we got the client to kind of understand our thought process. And then, and then we sort of, you know, ended it there with a kind of, and this is the world we want to take you into. And they, they, a lot of clients bought that. And that has changed since then, because now that our industry is global, I can't get to the people to convince them like that. So I had to do it in different ways. How do you do it now? Well, we do. We do. We make. Uh, we do do creative work in presentations because I've now got to talk to you know people in twelve different bloody markets, and, and that's the downside of today. I can't do anything about it. Um, but we try and make our. We still do the whole strategic thing, although clients have got much better at that now. So that bit has kind of it. Um, 
but you know, we, we just look for that great human truth uh, uh, and try and create uh, a piece of thinking for a client that isn't just about advertising, it's about a way the brand should behave. So we try and make it bigger than it actually is. Uh, and, I, and I always say, you know, I work in advertising, I don't live in advertising. Uh, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to affect social culture, I'm trying to affect, you know, uh, create a piece of work that becomes a, a part of the fabric of society, really, and that brand becoming more important in that, in that world. So that's the vision we try and give a client. We try and give them, this is the place we want you to be. So I think, in the end, clients buy you. And that's what we always found, you know, they buy you. Right at the back. Do you think the way agencies are compensated now, that it's a bit antiquated, like, uh, well, firstly, with the new ideas that are a bit more, like, we're, you know, now we're building little businesses and sub-brands, but also the fact that, like, whether we do good or bad, often we're compensated the same. Yeah, that, well, you know, when I came into the industry, it was the commission base, the commission system that operates. You got paid 15% commission um, every time the client ran the ad, commission from the media. Um, and that sort of changed in the, in the sort of <clears throat> late 70s, early 80s, it began to change, and we got, we went to a fee system. And at that time, people argued for the fee system because it meant that you you had a regular fee that you could run your business a lot better. Now we're going back and saying this is unfair because it doesn't recognize the quality of what you do. I, I, you know, if you can come up with a better system of payment and sell it, you'll do very well. So if you want to think about that one. <laughs> I mean, it is kind of ridiculous, but I, I, I don't know. Lots of great minds have thought about it, pondered it, wondered about it, and have sort of said, you know, it could be like this. Or it, but nobody's come up with a better system. And, Virtually every new agency that starts always says, we're going to be paid like this, you know, and in the end they end up with fees. <laughs> I know it's ridiculous because, you know, if I have a brilliant idea in, in you know, very quickly, I get paid less than the person who has a, a very bad idea that's taken them a long time to do it. Uh, work that one out. It's mad, but, you know. Life is not fair. <laughs> All right? Anybody who says to you, that's not fair, life is not fair fair. It's not fair that you're here, can, in this wonderful place, being going through this wonderful program and other people aren't. You know, it's not fair. As soon as we realize that, the better. Trying to make it as fair as we can, of course, is good, but ultimately it's not fair. Some people are born handsome, some people are not, some people are born, you know, you know, the, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> Sorry, say it again. When you set up BBH in the 80s, yeah. how different was it going to be from Saatchi and Saatchi and TBW in London, where it came from? Um, well, I, I think obviously we set it up because we felt we could do it um, in a better way. And uh, I mean, what we were doing is you are a product of your times when you, when you set a, a creative business up. You are of that moment in time. And, and then, of course, the secret is how you keep evolving. But, I mean, the thing that, that we did is, is um, we put strategic thinking right at, the, right at the heart of the agency. So it was about, really, John Bartle, who was the strategic uh, planner, uh, Nigel Bogle, who was uh, account man, uh, and run the business, ran the business, and myself as as the creative. It was looking at us having th this is what is going to this this these this is the team that will drive your business. Um, so it was subtly different from other agencies, but you know we we latched onto the whole essence of strategic thinking uh, is the way to unlock great creativity uh, and to give your brand the right direction, not just to do great work, but great work in the right direction. And that resonated at that time with clients. And that goes on, and that's still relevant today. I mean, more people do it. And we weren't the only ones doing it back then, I have to add. But, you know, it's like everything in life. It, 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 there are very, very few unique ideas. You're often just doing something that other people are doing, but you're doing it better. You know, uh, and, and so that's what we were doing at the time. And then over over, over time, we've, we've kind of evolved what we do. And that's why, by the way, we, we wouldn't do speculative creative work. To emphasize the fact that, you know, strategy is fundamentally important. In fact, it's so important that if you, Mr. 
prospective client won't engage with it, then we're not interested in having a conversation with you. And that way we've separated ourselves out. <coughs> and I think the interesting thing there is, if you're, when you start your own businesses, is to have a point of view. I mean, I think it's very interesting in, in you know, here we are um, in, a, in a world where we're advising clients on brands and, and how to brand and all of those things, and yet our businesses are very rarely brands. You know, what's the difference between JWT and Y&R and, R and um, Martin Soros made them all the same? He doesn't give a shit, you know. And, and we got criticised by the industry for having this view that, you know, you know, you're trying to be different. And we, said, and we were sort of labelled sort of arrogant. And it wasn't arrogance, we were just trying to define ourselves as a brand, you know. It's not arrogant if you go into a Ferrari showroom and say, well, I don't want to pay, you know, 150,000 pounds for a Ferrari, I'd like to spend 25,000 pounds, they throw you out. <laughs> you know, well, go down the road and buy a, you know, a GM or something, you know. And, uh, but, you know, that's what brands do, we advise them to kind of have a point of view. And we got criticised for that. Uh, it was a funny story once, because when we were, we were um, doing this non-speculative uh, creative process, I mean, first of all, all the editorial coverage from the industry was, well, it won't succeed, it won't go on, they'll have to drop it, blah, blah, blah. And it went on and on and on and on. We grew and grew and grew and grew. And about eight years into it, we were asked to pitch for a piece of business, still not doing expected creative work. And apparently one of the other agencies complained to the, the, the new client that it's unfair. And they said, well, why is it unfair? He said, well, BBH won't be doing creative work. And the client had to say to him, well, we're not asking you to do creative work. And it was the absurdity that our, what was a, had been seen as a problem was now an advantage. So I think, you know, you have to do that. You have to look at things and go, you know, great brands, I'm not saying we're a great brand, but I'm saying, you know, great brands have a point of view and they stick to it. And, and they can't, you can't be all things to all people. There are very few brands that can do that. Maybe a few supermarkets can do that, where they can go from, you know, very basic to very special. But most brands have a point of view. And if you're setting a, a company up, whatever it is, a design company, an advertising agency, or a gaming company, or whatever, you have a point of view. Uh, what was your lowest point in your career? As, uh, the highest points, more or less, are public. But... Um, I suppose getting fired from my first job was a fairly low point. Um, it was just as I was a lippy bastard. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, that was... That was, but it was good in a way. It was low but good, you know. And it it, uh, it kind of uh, got you to sort of respect your point of view, uh, understand that it had value. But actually, they, it came with a cost. Uh, but that was that was pretty low. So I was about a year and a half into to, uh, the industry, and one of the disadvantages back then, you know, if you hadn't been working for at least three or four years, you know, you, you, you couldn't get a senior job, you couldn't be put on a senior piece of business because you didn't have the experience, you know, you didn't know about, you know, different screens and different printing methods and stuff like that, you couldn't be trusted to, you know. So it was a bad time to be fired, but it was good that I did it, uh, and I'm, I'm in some ways pleased. So that was sort of low, but in the end, it, great lessons came from it. Yeah. When was the last time uh, in your career or any any special instance when you truly believed in something over a, some time and then you found out that you failed? Oh, so, it's something I believed in but it didn't work, is what you're saying. Um, I, I'm not... Well, not, mean, not that it didn't work, that you were personally wrong. Oh, I was personally wrong. <clears throat> Well, I've been wrong lots of times on, you know, people show me a script and I go, that won't work, or that's not very good, or that, and they've gone away and made it, and it's actually been very, very good. Uh, because nobody's right all the time. Uh, uh, I genuinely think I'm more right than wrong, and as I've, as I've been doing it longer and longer, I've got better at that. But, you know, anybody who says that, you know, they know, is a liar, uh, and I've, I've learned to say never say never. Um, but I think if you if you 
you're, you're going to be wrong on things. It's, it's bound to be the case. You're going to be, you know, it's going to happen. Um, because, it, you know, you're dealing with opinion. You're dealing with kind of point of view. I think what you do is you try and bring a huge number of principles and beliefs to bear. And hopefully that, 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 that sees you through it. I mean, funny enough, one of the things that I was completely wrong on, there was a wonderful Axe ad. And it, I think you've got a gold here at uh, Cannes. It was done about eight, nine years ago. And it was just a series of girls uh, talking to a man that you couldn't see their boyfriend or friend or something like that. And it was just a series of lines about, yes, of course, I, I, I don't mind you going lap dancing. Um, then another one would be going, of course, I love football. I think it's fantastic. And, and it was like sort of, and of course, he was, he'd sprayed himself with axe that these girls didn't mind. You know, kind of. And I, I thought it was a bit like a print ad. And I, we always used to have this joke about, you know, words on wheels. Um, and the television works, or cinema, or film, whatever you want to call it, works in a completely different way from print. Print is more logic-based, whereas film is more emotion-based. And I thought this was getting a bit too logical. I, could, I always thought, used to think to myself, if I could do it as a print ad, it wouldn't make a great film spot. And, and by and large, I'm right. And... and you know, if you look at the great work, it, it, you can take the essence of the idea and you reinterpret it into uh, film. But, uh, it, you know, print works in, some, in, in a certain way and film works in another way. So even though I, my, I was bringing my logic to bear, it actually broke the rules and didn't work. You know. So, yeah, it's going to happen. You know. Don't worry about it. So yeah. you have offices all over the world, so how do you manage that? How do you manage the creative output that comes out that's the same that everywhere? Well, it's not the same. Uh, we have seven offices around the world. The reason we, 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 we sort of, we like to call it the creative network as opposed to the sort of, you know, uh, the big sort of established networks. Um, we don't really want very many more offices because uh, it's just hard, you know, it's hard if you genuinely believe in the creative product and you genuinely believe in in kind of uh, what it is you're trying to create and you, you have a you have a passion for it I, I hate using that word but I'll use it um, I, I couldn't do it with 40 offices you know I, I, how could you do it I mean it'd be ridiculous you then become a machine you're then a machine so for us it would it would be you know probably we might add you know uh, one day we might be in in Russia, when they all stop trying to murder each other, um, <laughs> one day we might be in, you know, the Middle East when they stop trying to blow each other up, and you know, I mean, um, and maybe another office in China, you know. But we, you know, I could sort of see twelve being, you know. But how do you quality control? Is there? Well, you, you you hire the best people you possibly can. I mean, that's why. I, I, and I think, you know, we found it very difficult really have uh, and and you know uh, I mean you know we've just seen that AKQA has just been bought by um, by uh, uh, WPP and I don't know I mean, how, does anybody know how many offices they have around the world anybody know AKQA I mean I think it's something like 20 or 30 or something you could google it couldn't you and find out it's a great thing today isn't it you know there's a conversation you always used to have when you sit around and go no he that but in that movie the one with the kind of when he had the hair and that what was his name? What was his name? You spend an hour talking about it. Now, Google it. Oh, that's him. What are we going to talk about now? I don't know. Uh, we'll find out. What else we got to talk about? Um, but, you know, I sort of think, and I'm not you know, brilliant for them, but I think how, uh, I and mean, they've got something like 30 offices around the world. How can you do that in 10 years? I mean, it's just, you're just a machine. You know, we've hugely, hugely difficult finding fantastic people, finding people who can write great ideas, create great ideas build a company together, a team of people, unbelievably difficult. I mean, we've had our ups and downs in New York, and, and now I think we've got a fantastic team, but, you know, I've had three different creative directors in New York since since 2000. You know, three, you know. Please, stop. <laughs> Would you miss being uh, more involved in the creative process? Well, I'm not involved. I don't try and do their job for them. What I do is try and help them. And I'm there as a resource to kind of go, John, we need some help on this, da, 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 and I will go and help out. And that's the way I like to do it. I don't want to... Uh, eight, eight. 
Eight offices, AK Floyd. Is it eight? I think so. Oh, well, I've got it completely wrong then. But even so, eight offices since. Yeah. If you're planning to open in the Middle East, my creative director is going crazy. You can follow wherever you want uh, to get the missing. As long as you as soon as you stop blowing each other up, we'll be there, you know. I don't like bombs, you know. I mean. Yes. When was the first time that you came to Cannes? And how was your experience? Uh, the first time I came to Cannes was about 1989, I think. You've got to remember that Cannes is a very different beast to what it was. Yeah. You know, I mean, 20 years ago, we never came to Cannes. For us, it was, you know, it's a bit of a joke. Uh, and, and if you look at the history of CAM, mm -hmm. it was set up um, really for production companies. It was for film. And, and actually, the original CAM, only, you, only if it ran in the cinema could you enter uh, your film. So it was purely cinema. Then they extended it to television. So uh, when I first came, it was just television and, or, or film. <coughs> and then about 19... 93, 4, I think they added press and posters, and then you know they've expanded it since. But the thing that's happened to Cannes, and, and I think this is an in interesting lesson you know, great brands often aren't great brands because geniuses have kind of gone, Wow, I see the future, and it's like this. They're often brands that it happens to them. You know, Levi's didn't sort of sit down in about 1947 and go, Do you know, we're a workwear brand. If we became a fashion brand, we could charge three times the price and talk to many more people. It happened to them. They didn't do it. You know, youth of that day began to wear jeans as a, as a sort of fashion statement. And they woke up one day and said, Christ, you know, what's going on? Um, and it happened to Can. I mean, Can, as our industry became global, it became more important. And they, they surfed that wave. I mean, the important thing is to recognize your luck and go with it. I mean, of course, you know, some brands do. Uh, innovate and they do see the future, but a huge number of brands, it kind of happens to them. Yes, you were. Um, what's innovation for you and how does, as a discipline, fit within the ideal agency structure? Um, yes, that's a, that's a very good question because um, we get innovation and invention mixed up, don't we? And we get lots of words mixed up. Uh, although I'm an art director, you might, might, you might feel I'm slightly obsessed with words, but I think they are important. I mean, for me, innovation is where you, 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 have, a, you, have, a, you have a kind of established thought process and you innovate within that. So yeah. invention is when you create something totally new. So you take a new bit of you know, technology or whatever it is and you've, you've, you've completely invented something new. And, and there are gray bits between them. So is the hybrid car innovative or an invention, I would say it's an innovation. Um, but, you know, we, it, it, we, we sometimes do get those words very confused. Invention is something completely new. Innovation is, is, is constantly working to make something incredibly better uh, and, and using technology in different ways. And do, they, do you get them to make that? How does it work within an agency structure? Like, where would you see those two disciplines within? I think, I think that they happen everywhere, don't they? I mean, you're a creative company, I hope. And creativity is about kind of trying to think of new things, um, new ideas. I mean, I mean, you know, we have a product development division called Zag, where we're trying to come up with uh, new ideas for products. Um, but I think within the agency as a whole, you're kind of constantly, I mean, the whole thing of creativity is innovation, breaking down walls, doing new stuff. That's why we have a black sheep as our logo and say when the world zigs, you zag. I think by, you know, taking a different point of view or going against the crowd, you're likely to come up against new things because you're looking in a different direction. And I think, you know, the other thing that, for you, that, you know, the most important word you constantly use is why. You know, just why. Why? I mean, it's very annoying. You're like a child at that, you know, with some children like that, aren't they? Why? Why should I, you know, eat like, why? You know, um, but I think trying to hold on to that childlike kind of attitude to things is fundamentally important. And play is fundamentally important within that. I really hate doing this, but oh, I, know, I know you've got mm. something else happening, Mr. John, so if you've got time for 
Uh, one more question. Yes, and who? That gentleman there has an answer. Yes, good man. <laughs> <laughs> so, what your job as worldwide creative director look like? I mean, it's like being the pope with bishops in every country. <laughs> say, say, I did quite hear that. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what's your job as worldwide creative director looks like? How, how, what, what's this job? <laughs> what is this job? Yeah. Fucking stupid job, as far as I'm concerned. You know, because if I hire the best people, then let them get on and do it. I mean, uh, I mean, I always, I always think actually that that what happens to you is that you get elevated to a place where you don't really want to be. You know, I actually want to go back to being an art director. That's what I passionately love doing. I love having ideas, working with somebody, making them. For me, that's the fun. Sadly, what happens to you in your life is that you get pushed away from the things that you genuinely, genuinely love doing. I mean, that's one of the great, again, conundrums, you know. That's an, um, but, it, but in a sense, you know, I have to be a, a, a figurehead for the agency, which is fine. I don't mind doing that. But also, I have to help and guide all my... ECDs, because always there is this force within life that will try and make everything ordinary. As much as you don't want it to, there is a kind of natural thing to kind of rub the edges off, make it easier, blah, blah, blah. and what we've got to do is fight against that, and I help them do that. And I mean, you know, not just, you know, we're wonderful people in the agency, uh, on the management, planner side and everything, they're all trying to do that, but my job is to constantly inspire the creative people and enjoy the great work that comes out of the agency. Thank you very much.